Hi, Gabriel. Hi, am I audible? Hi, Gabriel.
uh, good day, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. And thank you to you, um, Dr. Darong, for joining us um, in today's session. Today's session um, focuses on the introduction of um, conducting a scoping review. And this session will be facilitated by Delta. Gabrielle Darong, who is a lecturer in the Anthropology Department of Rhodes University in the Eastern Cape. He currently lectures um, a families and household module previously um, to first year undergraduates and two modules to third year undergraduates at Rhodes University. He has done research um, on the field as well as um, he is currently the principal investigator of the medical pluralism in Makanda project embedded with uh, medical anthropology modules at Rhodes University. Um, just before going to you, Doc, um, just to alert the participants here today, I will be posting a link, which is an evaluation link for you to evaluate our workshops so that we can better work together and so that you can be able to provide more support that you would need in your research or academic journey. Without wasting any time, over to you, Doc, and thank you very much for agreeing to facilitate this lecture for us. All right, thank you so much, um, Asabe, and good afternoon to everyone here. So I'm just trying to see where the lighting is better as well. I'm Gabriel, and as my colleague has said, I'm from the Department of Anthropology, and but we all do literature review in different ways, and it, it is a good way to be able to share um, one of the ways in which I've learned the process of literature review and its importance to our work, whether we are students um, at postgraduate level, at undergraduate level, um, or we are academics at an advanced level. So the way in which I'll be engaging on our discussion of literature review today will specifically be around um, scoping reviews. But before we engage on that, um, it's important to just take a, a minute to reflect on what we really think of when we consider the concept of literature review or the process of what we call literature review. Um, and I, could, I will be happy if I will just hear what people um, have to say about this or what people think about this before I can carry on. Um, any ideas on what or any thoughts on what we consider as a literature review? Um, I'm happy to hear from anyone who wishes to contribute on this. Any hands or you can just switch on your mic and contribute before we carry on. Okay, so to... I think in, in simple terms, um, this is Hester speaking. In simple terms, it's it's just um, your research question is answered by consulting the literature. Okay, thank you so much, um, Hester. Anyone? Yes, I see James, your hand is up. Thank you, sir. Um, I didn't want to say anything i wanted my students to do so but uh, anyway a literature review is looking at what is written on a given topic so that you can identify gaps and also learn about how other people have investigated or researched that particular topic thank you okay, thank you so much james um and i think um yes time james have really summarized what we we normally will consider a literature review to say what has been done um, and what do we know about what has been done? Because it's easy for people to wake up and say, I want to do a research on ABC. The first question anyone will ask you is, why do you want to research this? Sometimes we say, well, because this has not been done in any way. The question then becomes, how do you know if it's been done or it's not been done? How do you know the extent to which it's been done? And how do you know where that has been conducted? And those are very important questions because then in the academia, we don't necessarily create knowledge out of a vacuum. We create knowledge built on what other people have already developed. And so what we constantly do is we refer to this as filling in the gap in knowledge. 
and how do you, we identify this gap in knowledge? Of course, it has to be from being able to know what knowledge is available or what knowledge other people have taken or have painstakingly um, developed. And that is appreciating the present, but also finding ways in which we can build onto what has been made available because it is almost impossible to consider any research that will be completely overarching that covers whatever possible topic in the world. You could think of something as simple as um, childbirth. You know, you say childbirth, what about childbirth? In what context? It could be about the support um, received by people who are undergoing childbirth. It could be about the experience of the person who is undergoing childbirth. It could be about the process itself for the physicians or for the um, for anyone who is assisting the mother in childbirth. And those are completely different ways in which you can tackle the issue of childbirth. And so not to spend much time on this, indeed, literature review is a way of allowing us to identify what's been done, um, but also to be able to say what's not been done. And then we can think of how we can do it. And so indeed, that takes us to why do we need a literature review? Indeed, we do need it because from the discussion we've had, if we don't know what has been done, the question then becomes, how do we get to claim to want to do something different? We can only claim that we can do something different if we can show that A, B, C has been done and there is no D. And so I want to do D and someone else tomorrow will come in and do E. And that is how we'll continually progress. And even when you think we've reached letter Z, someone might realize actually there is C.2.3 or whatever it is. And so that is how we will continue to develop knowledge. Um, but also because the human experience is continually evolving, the more human experience we have, the more society develops and evolves, the more issues will continually emerge. And so indeed our research is not only to address issues, but sometimes research is also about showing what is working well. And so you could be doing research to show what is not working well and trying to find ways of addressing it, or you could be doing your research to highlight that which is working well in a specific context and showing lessons in which we can borrow from and apply in different contexts where possible. And so some of the common features we will find in our literature review will be critique and assessment of different designs that will have been used, um, presentation of the data from the papers that have been um, analyzed, but also analyzing and synthesizing the findings from the papers. And we're not focusing on literature review in general today. So I will just be mentioning some of these common features, um, discussing the extent to which the research question has also been answered, um, identifying what is known and what remains unknown, but also standardized uh, methods of reporting your review. And so these are some of the common features in general literature review. And today we're really trying to focus on scoping review as a form of literature review. One of the key lessons I've learned over the years is that before you begin your scoping review, and we'll speak about what that actually means shortly, is that you need to ask yourself, is there any scoping or systematic review on the topic you're trying to address or the topic you're trying to explore? Because again, there is no point simply duplicating knowledge when it's been done by someone else. So what I learned to do before doing my first scoping review was actually doing a scoping review of scoping reviews. And that on its own is a method. Similar to what you will do with the scoping review um, process, but now you're focusing on scoping reviews or systematic reviews, depending on which you're trying to address. And so if you can find that, yes, this, this issue has been addressed already with a scoping review, the first thing to ask is, is there any gap that exists within these scoping reviews that have been explored or that have been written? If there is, what gap is it and how can I address that? It may be the gap in actual knowledge within the literature review, or it may be a gap in terms of context, or it may be gap in terms of error, and meaning a certain period of time. For instance, if the scoping review was conducted about HIV and AIDS um, covering the period 1994 to 2004, that is donkey years ago in the context of HIV and AIDS, or for instance, in the context of artificial intelligence, where knowledge is continually evolving almost every day. 
And so you could in that instance then say, well, I can actually do a scoping review as well from the period 2005 to 2013 or to 2014 or whichever years you decide to choose. Or, okay, the scoping review has been conducted, but it is focused on, say, for instance, India. And so there isn't any scoping review addressing this topic within the South African context or within the Tanzanian context or whichever context you're trying to look at. And so that might then be room for you to address um, that issue, even if it might be the same topic, but the, a different context or a different time period. And so when we say what a uh, scoping review is, um, it's been mainly developed by Levac et al. And they say it's a way of summarizing a range of evidence. And mainly, what, why do we summarize this range of evidence is to be able to show how much has been done on this topic or on this phen phenomenon you're trying to address. Um, but also, Colocon um, et al. also expand on this to say it's a, it's a form of knowledge synthesis and mainly meant to um, address questions in an exploratory manner. And that will then allow you to be able to show a range, again, a range of evidence or mapping key con um, concepts that have been discussed within the literature or types of evidence, but also ultimately trying to show the gap that exists within the literature. What has also been discussed at length is that a scoping review can allow you to eventually develop a systematic review. And we'll speak about why um, that is possible. It is possible because when you look at the aims, a scoping review mainly tries to map out a range of your information and showing the gap in the research. Whereas a systematic review will normally be there to assess effectiveness either of an intervention a condition um, or a methodology used. A scoping review will not be interested in assess assessing whether a certain intervention was effective or not or whether a certain methodology was effective in the type of study conducted or not. What a scoping review will normally do is to show you what's been done, and that is it. And so while a scoping review may be relevant within the context of your postgraduate study where you're really trying to show what's been done and what's not been done, it might not be relevant in a different context. In a different context, you might need to consider a systematic review. Also, when you look at your research question, your scoping review is quite um, broad, whereas your systematic review will be a lot more specific on a specific issue or either a specific methodology. And again, when you speak of the difference in terms of methodology, your scoping review really is not interested in assessing the quality of your methods whether the qualitative research method used was effective or not, whether the quantitative method used was effective or not, um, or whether the mixed method was effective or not, that is not relevant to a scoping review. A scoping review will mainly possibly and um, report on this number of studies looked at um, their research using a, a qualitative approach, or this number of studies looked at their studies using a a quantitative approach, not necessarily whether that approach was relevant to that question or not. A systematic review, on the other hand, will do that or will be required to do that. Was the method appropriate? Was the method effective? Did the method yield the appropriate or required results from that system, from that study? Those are the kind of questions you will ask when you're speaking about your methods in a either a scoping review or a systematic review. Also, with the types of study explored in the different approaches, a scoping review will normally explore any study, regardless of the method used, as long as it's able to then report on what knowledge is available. And you need to always remember, the aim is to report on what knowledge is available, not necessarily critiquing processes or methodologies. Whereas your systematic review will be intentional, mostly focusing on quantitative research. However, your systematic review can also be on qualitative research, but from the onset, there has to be a clear intention on what the focus is, because it's almost then impossible to want to systematic, um, to want to do a critique of methods, yet you mixing the methods being explored. So if you're looking at quantitative research, 
been used in exploring um, university students or postgraduate students' experiences, then focus on quantitative studies. So that when you're saying the use of quantitative study was either effective or not effective, you're able to generalize in that sense. Whereas if you want to use qualitative, um, focus on qualitative research, you focus on qualitative research, it almost then becomes um, quite um, flattered to then combine a review of the different methodologies. So for, for scoping review, there is no choice of what methodology you're using or you're exploring or you're analyzing. Your focus is on the studied phenomenon, regardless of methods used or context. But again, we'll get to a point where we'll speak about issues of context in terms of delineation or exclusion criteria. So according to um, um, Axie and O'Malley, as well as Levac et al., there are five um, steps that need to be considered. And so when people sometimes speak of scoping reviews, they, they're referring to it as a systematic review. And sometimes people will refer to a systematic review as a scoping review. As we've seen, there's a difference. But you will not be entirely wrong if you say a scoping review is systematic, but it is not a systematic review. It is systematic in the sense that it has a clear criteria, which you have to follow accordingly, and that then makes it a systematic. It's not haphazard, it's not random. You don't just pull papers randomly. You have to follow a specific process. In that sense, a scoping review is systematic, but it uses a systematic process, but it is not a systematic review because a systematic review is something different. And the five steps are identifying your research um, question, identifying the relevant studies, um, selecting your studies, charting and, analyze, and analyzing your data, collating, summarizing, and reporting your findings or results. I will take you step-by-step step on each of this to see what they practically mean and how you can go about them. And please, if you feel like I'm rushing a bit too much, do let me know. I'm just trying to be cognizant of how much time we have. Um, so that we don't take too much time. Otherwise, this can literally take a whole week for us to practically discuss and engage in the processes. So in identifying your research question, the first important step is developing your problem statement. And I easily tell my students that your problem statement will automatically become your introduction. And so work on it and give it as much time as possible. Because if your problem statement is not clear, and your introduction is not clear, the rest of the work will not be clear. So there has to be clarity from the onset on what you will be doing and how you'll be going about doing that, but also why you're doing that. And so for your problem statement, the first thing to consider is, consider is the context of your research. And this can either be context in terms of a geographical location in the real world or context in terms of a discourse. So for instance, um, South Africa can be a context, a hospital, can be a context, but also um, postgraduate education can be a context. And we will see shortly what that really means. And so when you're developing your problem statement, you need to ask yourself, what is the context of my research? And yes, it can be, as I've stated, geographical location, your discuss. And basically you're trying to say, for instance, um, postgraduate education. What about postgraduate education? Are you looking at or are you interested in? Um, it could be about the experience of developing a research proposal, or it could be about the experience of um, engaging in data generation or field work, or the experience of engaging with your supervisor, or the administrative processes of a postgraduate study. So you need to be clear on what context you embed in your scope and review in. And this will indeed be similar to what the context of your main research is. And we need to understand, and I will be speaking about this shortly, that your scoping review is not necessarily the same as your thesis uh, or your research, although it is strongly aligned, but we will see that there is a slight difference that you're not necessarily engaging in research with any 
human participants, for instance, or or with, within any physical context. Although it is about your research, but it is about the literature around your research, not the actual research itself. And so just another point before I go further, the major advantage of doing a scoping review, and I only learned about this when I was doing my PhD, and I wish I learned about it much earlier. And so what I do now is before you begin your PhD, I say you have to do your scoping review because oftentimes we develop a research proposal and we say the knowledge gap is ABC. And it takes really someone a few minutes to be able to pull out a paper that shows that what you're claiming to be a gap is not actually a gap, that it's been done. So ideally, especially for a PhD study, for a master's study, people do get away with it because a master's study doesn't necessarily require you to generate new knowledge. And so even if you develop in your um, knowledge, but from a different context, that will be okay. But with PhD, you expected to develop at least substantially some, um, not necessarily novel, but some substantially independent contribution to knowledge, not necessarily just a repetition of what someone has done. And you're not necessarily just trying to demonstrate your ability to review literature or to engage with um, research methods, but you meant to be a knowledge producer. And I say to people that when you get a PhD, you trust it that you can generate knowledge. And the first step is for me is to start with a scoping review. Can you identify the kind of knowledge that you wish to generate or you need to generate? Because just because you wish to generate knowledge AB does not mean that that is the knowledge that needs to be generated. And so in order to identify the knowledge that needs to be generated, your scoping review then becomes important. And so when you speak of the context in which you want to generate that knowledge, the next is to say, what is the problem within this context? What is not working well? Or what is working extremely well that I want to highlight? And that then gives you some room to say, okay, yes, um, postgraduate students experience of being supervised. That is the context. What is the problem in that context or what is not working well or what is working extremely well that you wish to um, engage in? And the problem really might be um, lack of response from supervisors or lack of supervisors response to emails, which I know is a common issue. Um, but others, it might be um, unrealistic expectation from supervisors where supervisors might expect very tight timelines or turnaround times while the student might be feeling overwhelmed and might wish to take it a bit slow. So what is the problem? And then the next point in your problem statement is the gap. And this we say exists within the scientific world. And that is the gap in knowledge. What don't we know about this problem? What don't we know about postgraduate students experience of um, difficulties in engaging with their supervisors? or getting response from their supervisors or managing the high demands from their supervisors? What don't we know? And your answer might be, well, we don't know how that affects their progress in, in their study. Do they end up dropping out? Do they end up changing supervisors or do what some people will call soldier on? And what is the effect of that? And actually your study, for instance, could actually be just the fact that you, you're trying to understand the effect of um, difficult relationships between supervisors and your students on how the students eventually also supervise. Because many people will say how you get supervised will likely be how you will supervise. But others will say a lot of people will supervise the complete opposite way in which they were supervised especially if they experience difficulty. So they will, for instance, say, I don't want other people to go through this. Or you will get those who will say, this was done to me. I think that is how everything should be done. And so I will do the same thing to other people. And so what don't we know? And that is where you're saying you're focusing on the gap. You can get your gap in knowledge in different ways. The first is that you might be lucky to get a seminal paper or some seminal papers, and seminal papers will mean um, highly valued papers around the topic in which you're addressing. And there are people that are normally called um, experts within fields, that when you're looking, for instance, at a certain topic, it will be almost uh, 
a sin to not make reference to a specific author. So such authors, for instance, if they've written a paper around that issue, such a paper will normally be regarded as a seminal paper, but also look at how many times that paper has been referenced. It is most likely a highly relevant paper in the field. From such a paper or from such a publication, is there a clear indication that what you are claiming to be a gap is indeed a gap? So for instance, in the recommendation, the paper or author or authors might have said, um, we do not have sufficient knowledge on how um, challenging supervision experience affect academics when they become supervisors. Then boom, you will say, well, I've hit the jackpot. That is my um, evidence, or that is the evidence that indeed this is a gap. Or another way of saying, how do you know about your gap is that you've looked at some literature and you can then comfortably, to some extent, um, say, well, from this literature, which seemed to be the most um, highly used or cited literature around this topic, there isn't any discussion. Although the literature discusses um, postgraduate students registration experience, um, experience in doing field work, experience in analyzing, or experience in translating or transcribing, but it doesn't really speak much about academics who, who now almost um, are affected by how they were supervised. And so you might say, actually, then that might be what I want to look at, because these papers are not mentioning that. So that's another way to identify your gap in literature. And colleagues, that's how we can then speak of, say, you building your evidence to say, does your problem statement show evidence to your claims of what you say is a research gap? And remember, this is before your scoping review. So what you're thinking is the gap at the beginning of your scoping review might not remain the gap when you're done with your scoping review. However, this gives you room to actually then begin the scoping review. So this contributes to your writing of your um, protocol or proposal for a scoping review. This is not a proposal for your actual master's or PhD research. It is a proposal for your scoping review, and that serves as a guide on how you actually go about doing your scoping review afterwards. Just like any introduction, yes, your problem statement will be the first draft of your introduction, but by the time you're done with your study, you will have to go back and you may need to amend that introduction. So what you had claimed as a gap might then change based on your findings. It's important to take note of that. And this is the case, whether you're writing a, an article for publication, many people will say the introduction is the last part they write. Some will say, write a draft first, but keep in mind that you will have to come back and actually change it. And then the next point to consider is the need for your study. Why do you need to carry out this study? And that is pretty much straightforward. You need to carry out the study to fill in the knowledge gap. You need to carry out the study for us to be able to know how supervision experiences actually shape how academics also supervise. And then the purpose of your research to say, fine, if we've known about um, how academics have been shaped to supervise based on this experience of being supervised, and so what, what then? Why do we need to know that? That then takes you back to your context. You filled in the gap, it takes you back, sorry, to your problem and eventually to the context. If the need is to fill in the gap, the purpose then is that the problem will be to some extent resolved, or at least we can find some solutions to the problem itself. And the context will then operate in an ideal manner. And so you see, we start from context, problem, gap, evidence, and then need, we get back to the gap. Purpose, we get back to the problem and the context. And so you say, what do you want to ask of the literature at this stage? What is your um, provisional question? It's important to know that this is different from your, your, your study question. And this is different from your key questions as well. This will be broad and specifically in relation to the literature. And so an example using what we've been discussing is to say, what is the literature review or what is the literature knowledge around the effect of 
supervision experiences on academics' approach to supervision. And this is just me thinking wild. Um, of course, it can be cleaned up and you can think more deeply around it. And remember, we're still on just the first of the five steps um, as suggested by Axia Nomali and Levac et al. Once you've identified your provisional research um, question, the next is to consider the framework in your research question. What is the question framework? And there are a number of frameworks that are prevalent or used. Um, and I'm happy to share some of the reference to these frameworks. But some of the commonly used frameworks would be PICO, where you're looking at what is the population embedded in your research question? What is the intervention? Um, what is the comparison? What is the outcome? Or PICO with a small o, what is the population? What is the interest? What is the context? Or PCC, what is the population? What is the concept? And what is the context? And the second and the third, you will find are the most commonly used um, frameworks. And that definitely, for a lot of um, research with human populations, you will likely have a population you're engaging with. For instance, the example we've been given, it's either postgraduate students or academics. Um, what is the interest or also called the phenomenon, um, phenomenon of interest? It is about postgraduate supervision. Um, what is the context? The context can be higher education or it can be a geographical location such as South Africa, or it can be um, a specific university. And then there is PICE, which looks at the setting, perspective, um, intervention, comparison, and evaluation, or SPIDER, looking at the sample, phenomenon of interest, design, evaluation. So you need to think clearly to say from the question I've developed, what framework is emerging? And this is important because a lot of the times we then look for literature that does not cover our research question effectively. We look for literature that is absolutely one-sided. And so you will see shortly why it's important to think carefully about your question framework, because when you then search for your literature, it's important that, that all components of your research question, at least all key components of your research question are covered in your literature search. Okay, there's a, um, there's a comment by Esther. I used to wonder how I can regard a paper as a strong evidence, now I know one way to consider how many papers reference the article. Um, absolutely. And so remember, the high number of referencing does not automatically mean that that was a great paper or that is a highly relevant paper. A paper might be referenced many number of times because it is highly controversial and people are disliking what the author has said. And so people might then refer to it as an example of a controversial issue. But regardless, whether it's controversial or um, positive, whichever way we see it, it's contributing to the discussion around the issue. And so this is just an example where we're saying, how do we identify our research question? And the example here is the title could be Mapping Emotional Coping Interventions for Healthcare Providers, a Scoping Review Protocol. But the question then becomes, is it really um, a scoping review. And there are key things we then start looking at. There is the word investigate. In your aim, there is um, there are the words effectiveness of emotional coping skills. And when we think back at the difference between our scoping review and a systematic review, we will know that automatically this is definitely a systematic review and not a scoping review. Because it is specific looking at effectiveness which is what a systematic review does. And so if you have your um, keywords that you've developed from your framework, you then need to plot them into a table where you will have your primary keywords and your secondary keywords. Um, what is the primary keyword? And when you think of your secondary keyword, it's not necessarily a synonym, although people often think you're speaking about a synonym, but that is not necessarily the case. You're saying, what other words are used in place of this concept? For instance, a study conducted with young people, 
another way young people get referred to will be teenagers um, or boys or girls um, or students even. So you need to be aware that the synonym of a boy is not a student, but in literature, when people are doing research with young people, students are young people. When they say a boy, it is a young person. When they say a girl, it is a young person. So that's how you need to understand the secondary and primary um, keywords. They are not synonyms, but they are words that are used in literature, sometimes in place of a specific concept. And it could even be a word used colloquially, that it might not be a formal word, it's not officially so, but people do use it. For instance, um, age gap relationships. It is referred to in literature as um, either blesser blessy relationship, sugar daddy um, relationships, or sugar ma mother relationships, or whatever other concepts. And so you then need to be aware of this. And so the question becomes, how do you know what those um, key concepts are? How do you find them? And these are just some examples from the example I had shown earlier, where if you're speaking about nurses, secondary keywords might be caregiver, a medic. If you're speaking about the concept of um, well-being, sometimes it's used aligned in alignment with stress, anxiety, burnout, which some will consider as opposites or happiness, exhaustion, context, like I said earlier, could be a health setting, for instance, or an institution, um, but also it can be a geographical setting or a discuss. And so getting back to the question of how do you identify these key concepts? It's important because your key concepts you can identify from firstly having a think tank um, engagement or what people will call a roundtable discussion with people that are considered experts in the field to say, what words do you normally refer to this? But also from the literature, when you read the literature, what kind of words are used in reference to a specific concept, um, but also the keywords in certain seminal papers, how are they used and what do they refer to? And so once you have your key concepts, you create what is called a Boolean search. And this is a critical aspect of your work because it then allows you to combine the different um, aspects of your framework. As you will see here, we have, um, for instance, if we had used the PCC, we'll have your population, you'll have your concept, and you'll have your context. And so using our example, the population is nurse or medics or caregivers. And when you use an asterisk, it means it can be nurses. It means basically that there are other um, letters that might follow after this. So nurse might simply just be the prefix. Um, and when you say end, you're saying that basically your paper needs to have the population and it needs to have the concept and it needs to have your context. So that when you impute this Boolean search into your database, Yes, you will find papers that might not be relevant, but you will not miss out on any paper that speaks to your research. So that by the time you go through your scoping review, there will be no way you've missed any relevant paper if you've done this properly. And so even for your concept, for instance, if it's more than one concept, you will write the first concept, then you will say or, the next concept or the next concept. And then we get to your context clinic or now you see we've used inverted commas when we've written healthcare center. That is important because if we simply write healthcare center without inverted commas, it basically means your um, database will pull up papers that might simply just say health, papers that simply say care, papers that simply say center. But when you use your inverted commas, you mainly saying you want your database to read this as one word. And so papers that should be pulled should literally have the words healthcare center following each other just the way you've written it. Once you've gotten your um, first Boolean search, remember it does not automatically mean that this will be your final Boolean search. 
you will definitely explore this further and engage in different combinations because sometimes you will try your first search and realize that it is too wide. And so you'll have to go back and see, have I used the right terms? What terms do I need to include or what terms do I need to um, exclude? But also you need to start thinking of your delineation. Are you trying to um, restrict this to a specific location? If it's a country, for instance, then you possibly need to consider adding the country. If it's a specific um, age bracket, you might actually start thinking of it, although it might not appear, or it's a specific population that needs to use, um, that you will need to use a specific word, then you might need to consider doing that. So your population, your concept, and your context need to be absolutely clear. And so your inclusion and exclusion criteria has to then be developed once you've started um, developing your Boolean search to say, do we want to consider the years of publication? Is it the last 10 years, last five years, or is it open? Should it be within specific years, 2005 to 15, or when? Do we want to consider a specific geographical location? Do we want to consider a specific language? Um, but also the general relevance, what type of study do you want to focus on? Do you want to focus on just peer-reviewed literature um, or including gray, gray research? And most times scoping reviews are not conducted by one person. Ideally, it should not be conducted by one person because if it's one person, you will get to a stage where you will become absolutely biased and you may start including papers that shouldn't be included or excluding papers that shouldn't be excluded. Once you have your delineation clearly outlined and your um, Boolean search clearly defined, the next is to now start identifying your literature. And this you will do, of course, from different databases. You'll first have to decide with your partners what database you're using. Um, one database that might give you very great result will be um, Google Scholar. However, for your scoping review, you might consider otherwise. You might need to consider more um, discipline-specific databases. For instance, if you're conducting research in public health, PubMed, EBSCOhost, Science Direct will usually be some of the key um, databases you use. If you're conducting your research in, a, in education, consider also education databases, um, if you're conducting your research in politics, there are specific politics databases you will have to consider. Once you've imputed, and again, I said earlier, this ideally could be a discussion for a week because it helps when it's done practically, but like we've agreed, this is just a, a summar, summarized introduction to this process. You will need to follow up a lot more um, beyond today. So once you've imputed, you will get your hits. It's important to simply export everything to your citation manager. Do not start reading whether it's relevant or not relevant. At that stage, it's none of your business. You simply export everything to your citation manager. And you will do the same for all the databases you're choosing to use. Ideally, you should have about three to five databases. You cannot use one database and say you've conducted a scoping review. That's basically you just mapping the literature and not a scoping review per se. You download or export each um, to the citation manager, and I will show just how you can create different folders within your citation manager. It depends on the citation manager you're using. Um, I use normally EndNote. You could use Mendeley or other citation managers. And the first thing I do, I create a group set, and this will be my group set which I may name initial downloads or databases or whatever you want to name it. And then within that, you create folders. So for instance, here I have Scopus, Science Direct, EBSCOhost, and so on. An important aspect to this is to use numbers. I've used numbers here because Scopus was the first I exported, Science Direct was the second I exported, EBSCOhost was the third, and so on. If you do not use numbers, they will simply appear alphabetically. And I will show us shortly how that can be a problem 
if we do not number what we're trying to do. So once you've downloaded your different um, citations, as you will see here, even the data sets, I've numbered them because I, again, want to have a systematic flow or chronology to what I've done. If I do not add numbers to even my data sets, they will again appear alphabetically. And so number one for me is initial downloads per database. And you can name this whatever you want. There's no strict rule to that. Number two for me then becomes study relevant. I call it inclusion and exclusion. Within this database, you create folders again. And it's important to, again, number your folders. The first folder for me will then normally be what I call the working folder or the general folder. That folder will be what will contain all your references. So as you will see here from the previous slide, from our initial downloads, we have a combination of all sources from all the databases used. You simply click on that, it will display all your sources here. You press Control A, you press Copy, and you leave this data set and you move to the next data set. Remember, you copy, not cutting. As you move to your next data set, you paste everything in your working folder or general folder. And that is where all the work will be done. From this folder, you begin checking depending on what your delineation is. You begin checking, for instance, in this case, I've said that non-English articles will be excluded. And so I have to create a folder for non-English articles. So I check, and that is easy to do. You simply just scroll through the titles and see is there any that is not in English. If there is any, you cut it and put it in the non-English folder. You go back, it means minus two from your working folder. The number will keep reducing until your working folder is zero or empty. You take out the non English titles, the next you're checking your titles for duplicates. At this stage, again, you're not checking whether it's relevant or not. You're simply just reading through your titles and say, okay, there is cost of stroke in low and middle income countries. There is another one. You take one, you leave one. And then here, there are four, um, four of the same titles. You take out three, you leave one. An easy way for me is normally to press control while you selecting this. But remember, if you do that and you forget, you will unhighlight everything and you repeat the process again. So if you're not sure that you might stay focused, it's better to then do it one after the other, one after the other. You cut, you paste to your duplicated folder. And then the next stage after you've removed, removed your duplicates is to now start checking for the relevance of your titles. Remember up until this stage, you don't, bother yourself whether a title or an article is relevant or not. You're simply saying, is it in English? Is it a duplicate? And at this stage, you're now looking at whether it's relevant or not. How do you consider relevance? You have to go back to your um, delineation. Do you have a specific year? Um, do you have a specific timeline or years in which you're working with? If, for instance, we have said only papers from 2000 will be looked at, Already we have a paper from 1991 without even bothered, being bothered about what the paper is about. This paper is irrelevant to the scoping review. But that's the first thing I check. You remove those that are not relevant in terms of years of publication. Then you start looking at the title. Is it speaking about your population? Is it speaking about your context? And is it speaking about the concept or phenomenon of interest? And that takes you again back to your um, question framework. Remember the table we spoke about earlier. And this really becomes important when you start looking at this. And your mind has to stay fresh at all points because you may easily start getting yourself confused. And so if, for instance, you're looking at um, a paper on teenagers, and then here you find a paper on government officials, automatically you know that's not relevant. So if, for instance, it speaks about your research is about teenagers and smoking at um, taverns. And then you see a paper that says government officials and smoking in taverns. Yes, it's speaking about smoking in taverns, but it does not speak to the right population. Or it might even be teenagers smoking in schools because the context has changed. It's no longer a tavern, but a school 
automatically that paper is not relevant. So you remove the non-relevant um, um, titles. And at this stage, you're only looking at the titles, right? And the next stage you're looking at, again, if you're not sure, you leave it. And that's always a rule that you keep to. When you're not sure, you leave it. So for instance, an example here, the effects of relaxation response on nurses' level of anxiety, depression, well-being, work-related stress, and confidence to teach patients. We keep it because title appears to be relevant, speaking about stress, issues of anxiety, and that is relevant. But when it speaks, for instance, about anxiety in adolescents, we remove, and I'm using the same example I had used earlier. Or when it starts speaking about um, attitude towards evidence-based practice, again, it shows that it's relevant, you include it. The big rule is if you're not sure, you leave it till the next stage because the next stage will allow you space to go in depth. Then the next stage is your abstract selection. At this stage, you're looking only at the abstracts. It means you've looked at all titles already. You've removed all titles that are not in English. You've removed all titles that are duplicated. And now you're looking at your abstracts. And remember your delineation again when you're looking at your abstracts. Most studies will give you a clear idea at this stage whether it's relevant or not. But indeed, there are studies that will still not be clear even at an abstract level. So it means you might need to keep it to the next stage. If you're sure that it's relevant, you keep. If you're not sure whether it's relevant or not, you keep. If you're sure it's not relevant, you remove. And again, remember, you're not deleting, right? You're simply moving it to the non-relevant abstract folder. The next stage is your full paper selection. At this stage, you're not necessarily reading your paper for understanding. You skim reading your paper to identify its relevance. There will come a time when you will need to read it for understanding and for extraction of data. At this stage, it's really whether it's relevant to your study or not. And this basically, um, colleagues, will be your final stage to make up your mind. So if there is a paper you might have been pushing from the title level where you're not sure, you're not sure, at this stage, you now have the full paper open to you. You cannot not be sure beyond this stage or at this stage, because beyond this stage, there is no any other inclusion or exclusion um, level. And so this is how then your... Um, inclusion and exclusion create, um, folder or group set will look like, where you've selected right to the point where you're saying, there's only one study which is relevant. And this is a case where I was actually doing a scoping review of scoping reviews, and there was one paper that I found to be relevant to the study. And so the next stage is your data charting and um, analysis. There are a number of themes that you will need to consider when um, thinking of charting your data. There is um, the group referred to as background information methods and findings. And in the background information, you have things such as your title, the author, um, the country of publication, or the province, if it's from a specific, if you're focusing on just one country, but also the population being focused on. And the methods, you have your study design, sources of data, sampling, data collection tools used, analytical framework used, intervention description, and findings, you have your points there as well. Remember, it does not mean that you have to extract all of this information. You and whoever is conducting your scoping review will need to decide on what information you're focusing on and why. And those decisions form part of your scope and review report. And once you've decided, you will have a table such as this, where you have your title, your year of publication, and basically you copy and paste in that information as it is. And this is just a continuation of the charting um, table. As you will see, there are certain papers that will not have certain information and other papers will have that. And that is okay, because when you begin your analysis, you're able to report on which paper says what or which paper has what information. Um, 
and that is part of what you do. And so beyond your extraction group, you may decide that actually I want to go further. I want to create a group set that looks at the themes that are emerging. And this really um, is up to you. It's not a requirement. Um, this was me trying to push the boundaries to say, okay, I want to now start putting papers according to specific themes that I'm already reading so that when I want to start writing about specific themes, I don't have to go through the whole papers. I can simply just go to specific folders and look at those papers. And the last um, stage from the five stages we've discussed is collating, summarizing, and reporting your results. And basically, this is where you're doing your data analysis. Um, you're pulling out the themes or you're showing the themes that have emerged, just like you will do with your data that you've generated in your fieldwork. This is also considered um, fieldwork, but online fieldwork or desktop fieldwork. And your papers basically are like your participants. And so the information you've extracted on your data extraction sheet will be the same as your manuscripts or not your manuscripts, your transcripts. And so you begin literally um, identifying the codes and um, themes that are emerging from the data you've extracted. Another important aspect then becomes your prism chart. So remember, we had folders. And in each folder, there was a number. Basically, the number of records that are there, the number of records that have been removed. It's important to have a record of this. Because this is one of the first things your reviewers will look at to say, which um, at what level was high extraction or high exclusion made? And why was that the case? For instance, if you have 10,000 articles from the beginning and you've only finally included five articles, then there is a huge question to say, how did we move from 10,000 to five articles? But maybe from 1,000 to 50 or 100 articles, that is most likely okay. But when there is a major gap from the first record to the last record, then people will begin to question what happened in between. And why is there a um, highly questionable shift? It could be that your um, Boolean search was extremely wide and not highly relevant with um, what you need to do. Hence the high change in the number of articles. Yeah, and yeah, these are just some of the um, references one can look at when you Speaking of your scope and review. And thank you so much, colleagues. Please don't forget oh, to read so the, the line at the bottom. <laughs> um, do you have any questions, colleagues, quickly, as we are also running out of time? Okay, there is no question. It means it's either as um, as clear as coffee or as clear as clean water. <laughs> Let's take clean water, of course. <clears throat> There's a question, Jane, do you wanna come in? Yeah, yes, yes. thank, thank okay. you. Thank you, Gabriel. Thank you, C uh, Center for Postgraduate Studies. This is really a seminar presentation, if I may quote you, Gabriel. And I think it will be very useful for most of our students. Can you please, I know you share a video, but if you could also share a PDF of the presentation, that would really be brilliant so that we can share with all our students who are not here. Thank you, thank you very much, Gabriel. No, no problem at all. Jane, you can come in. Okay. Um, thanks so much for the, this very, Detailed session. Sorry. Um, what I would like to ask is, 
will there be another session or something of that sort? So, because getting to the end of it, you could see that it's more of, it should have been a practical something. So some of us will get it in a better and be, you know, get becomes more useful to us. If not, I don't know. If we are able to uh, have a, uh, this, uh, go at it, can we have Gabriel there or someone to go back to ask questions, what we are doing, if we are online or we are doing the right thing on our own sometime. Thank you. Okay, that will be up to the center, I will think, um, but I'm happy to engage further with ACP to see how that is possible. Sorry, yes, since yes, we are I rushing. Think... Sorry, Hi, since we are rushing. Sorry, since we are rushing for time, I thought ACP there is a short course on scoping reviews. Please correct me. Um, no, which we will have be a offered. Short application. But um, just to respond as well, um, outside of scoping reviews, in terms of literature, we do have an upcoming workshop that will be facilitated by Kirsten on a literature review, how to do literature review. But um, I'm gonna take the suggestion and I hope in the evaluations, um, you have clicked Jane to add into the evaluation that this workshop would have been great as a short course. So that as we work for our programming next year, we do actually create or cater for a short course on scoping reviews. Otherwise, for this year, in terms of budgeting and the programming, we have set out everything that needs to be done this year, but we are meeting uh, at the beginning of second semester to work on the program next year. But there is a workshop upcoming on um, literature review. If there's a second part, um, now this one, is putting you in the corner, Gabriel. If there's a second part on this presentation, please be in touch with me. We can find a day where we can have a workshop, even if it could be a full day workshop that is run, of course, online um, with regards to the second part that you think would be beneficial as a day um, workshop or as a two hour, one hour, 30 minute um, additional workshop. We can work on that. We can put it in our programming on a specific Thursday because all Wednesdays are occupied. And it could be in the afternoon where we just do two full hours or in our 30 minutes, but we can engage more on that. No, I'll be absolutely happy with that. Um, like I said earlier, ideally this should take much longer for mm -hmm. practicality reasons, um, but I will be happy if another option is developed for us to meet. But colleagues, I honestly have to run. Um, I'm facilitating mm -hmm. a seminar session, which was meant to begin at two. But thank you so much for inviting me for this. Um, I look forward to engaging with all of you again. Thank you very much, colleagues. And thank you very much for joining us. And thank you, Gabriel, for facilitating this workshop. Do have a wonderful Thursday further. I'll be uploading the video. And also, if you send me the presentation, I will send to everyone who registered um, for this workshop together with the recording. Thank you, bye.